Hi, I'm Trevor Mueller, writer of Demon City. You can find me at Trevor A. Mueller online on social media or at TrevorAMueller.com. And you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today, as of this recording, by the reigning, defending, 11-time guest champion on Two Geeks Talking. You know his work, of course, from Albert the Alien, Los Ojos, now Demon City. And if he keeps making more comics, I am going to have no room in his lower third whatsoever to display any of his creative works to the point that I'm just going to have to put it as subtitles beside his headshot in his guest portfolio right here today. Of course, we're joined by the ever-talented Trevor A. Mueller. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Kurt. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me back. I think my goal in life is to make it so that you have to do uh, an ever-scrolling list yes. of titles, like the end credits in a movie, yeah. but it's all books that I wrote. Look, it's going to be flashing like on, on the center column. And when I switch to, it's going to be on every side of you. And it's just going to keep going up and down here. You know, it, it'll be the ever, the ever scrolling titles of Trevor Mueller. It'll be your bibliography of, of the ages, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, thankfully, like certain titles will end and, and they can be retired and you can just focus on the newer work. So there are options there that don't have to make an eyesore for your for your viewers. <laughs> It'll be like, oh, this guy again. What is it? What genre is he into now? Which amazing comic am I going to have to pick up and read? You know, it's going to be just an ever evolving thing for you. And, and I think that's a good thing, not only for myself as a host, but for those that get to pay attention to your creative journey as an amazing person. Well, if, and if I can be honest with you for a moment, I mean, the reason why I do so much variety in the titles that I write and the genres that I go after, and and now with Los Ojos and, and Demon City being mature readers' books, Albert the Alien being for young readers, you know, my, my webtoons are for teens. The reason that I have such a variety on there is because my goal is to have a book for everyone on my table whenever you meet me at a convention. That's that's the plan. There are a handful of genres that I don't have out yet, but I'm currently working on. And then there are, you know, like I haven't done young reader stuff in a little while since the Albert books ended, but we're going to be fixing that in the next two years. So always more coming down the pipe. And my goal is just... You know, I want somebody for everyone so that when they come up to me at a convention, I say, what do you like to read? And they go, I like this thing. I'm like, I've got just the book for you. Nice. Well, you're going to have to then replace all of your amazing comics behind you with your own work. I mean, it's you're just going to have to like start <laughs> figuring out what do I replace with what I've created? You know, I mean, that's going to be a very difficult redistributing of your comics back there. You know, you know, I, I can't get rid of these. Uh, I am a fan as well as a creator. These are all books that I love. I, I have tried to limit the titles that I buy now, uh, mostly trying to support my friends, but I can't help it because every now and then, you know, somebody makes a, a story that's just too good for me to pass up and I and I have to go out and get it. So but I only have so much shelf space. So. <laughs> well, that's only what we can see. I think you have four other walls or three other walls you can like probably put bookshelves on. Well, yes, uh, there are windows that we have to dodge. And then uh, I'm in my home office right now, which I share with my wife. So she's got artwork on one of the walls, too. And then there's an entryway. So technically, there's only like a, a wall and a half worth of stuff and we have to be careful because there's like a closet in here that we've got to dodge too so but i mean there are three bookshelves behind me you can only see two of them at the moment my wife gets one of those bookshelves right. uh <laughs> and and it's funny because these are her bookshelves huh? um when we first started dating you know she cleared like a shelf for me maybe two and i was like we're gonna need a little bit more room because i'm a collector but she used to work in publishing Nice. And so she has a lot of books, not just stuff that she likes to read, but stuff that she either helped get out into the world or creators that she liked to work with back when she was doing publishing. Now she does a, a very different day job. But nice. um, but so those titles have sentimental value for her as well. Whereas like these are just my guilty pleasures. 
<laughs> Fair enough. Look, we all have our hobbies and we all enjoy what we enjoy. And I'm glad that you're, you're able to showcase that whatsoever. Obviously we here to talk about Demon City. Got to read the book. It is really an incredible book. I love the fact that it's an amazing genre. It's filtering into the horror genre that you're doing, but it, let's talk about Demon City and why this is the next step in the Trevor Mueller saga of creating comics. Two things, I guess three things that I kind of like about storytelling. So one is world building. Like the world building element of Demon City was really, really fun. And I wanted to set this story in a post premature biblical apocalypse, right? So the setup is, is that the biblical apocalypse has happened for 30 minutes, demons from hell spewed out into our world. And then suddenly it just stopped. And now they're stuck here. It was a premature apocalypse. I'm told it happens to everybody. Uh, and so because of that, you now have this, this unique kind of sandbox and playground in which to kind of tell a story. Mm -hmm. And so, be, you know, in, in this world, demons are stronger, faster, better than humans. They have different weapons. They're immune to our weapons. They are setting up situations where human procedure, human uh, defenses cannot stand against them. They've all been quarantined inside the city of Chicago, which used to be called the Windy City, and in our story is now called Demon City. And so the story revolves around this idea that the cops can't keep up with the type of crime that these demons are doing. So they have to bring in a demon to help them out. And that's not in demons nature. Demons do not necessarily want to do good, but there is one demon among them named Horace Nightingale who is looking for redemption. And so Horace has a bit of a mysterious past himself. He's come into a situation where he is not liked by his peers he is not liked by his community um, because he is trying to do good things. And so he and his partner in typical buddy cop fashion do not get along, but they are thrust together into this, uh, this case, this murder mystery where somebody has now killed death, the personification of death, and no one else can die. And so his first case is the last homicide that will ever happen after the end of the world. And I thought that that was a neat concept to play with and can have some fun dynamics to, to play within the buddy cop kind of crime noir uh, framework. That was the one thing I loved reading this because while I knew it was a buddy cop, I didn't know how you're going to approach it. I didn't know if you're going to go more comedy. I didn't know if you're going to go like strictly like law and order procedural or if you were just going to go like lethal weapon and just go crazy on it where, where the captain's like, you know, damn it. I want your badge, put your, you know, you know, things like that. And, and there was hints of that throughout it, but it, mm -hmm. it just fit. It was a great read overall. I loved the, look, the art was amazing. It was great storytelling. You know, you have memorable characters to say the least, quite literally. Um, mm -hmm. It was, I, I don't want to spoil anything because I'll let you do that. But, you know, I think that it's just one of those things that if you'd like Los Ojos, I think you'll definitely like Demon City just because of, you know, that amazing um, haunting genre that you've started to put together. So I, I think it's incredible. Yeah. And, and I think that the, you know, we as a society put a lot of value on life, but what happens in a society where death is no longer an option mm -hmm. and we explore some of the horrors of that in this story. We didn't do it as much as I, as I wanted to, I ran out of space, unfortunately, to do some of the things, but obviously you, you've got people who are at the end of their life and they are, they are ready to move on to the next stage and they can't do it. Or you have people who have been fatally injured and suddenly they are left there unable to pass on. And there's only so much that medical science can do for them at this point because they should not be alive, but supernatural forces are keeping them in this world and they are literally being tortured within this environment. And so we, we have some of those elements within this story. We don't fixate and focus on them too much, um, but there were more areas in there that we wanted to go down and we, we just had to compress it a little bit for time. Cause this book is going to be 168 pages, six issues into 168 page deluxe hardcover graphic novel. So it's a lot. Um, but simultaneously, like we always could have explored more mm -hmm. and if it does well, we can do sequels to it. Uh, whereas Los Ojos was kind of designed to be. Uh, a trilogy like this story is set to be like this one book is the mystery 
And if we want to do more, we can do another mystery in another book, but you get the complete story within this volume. No, definitely. And and it, that was the one thing I liked about this was it was a complete story. You could read it from beginning to end. You can still reread it and, and catch different things that you saw. You know, the the artwork was was beautiful here. Who is the team around this particular series? Uh, were, were any of them from, say, past books that you've completed? No, uh, so no, this was the first time I had worked with this creative team. And we made this this story, this was another pandemic baby for me. <laughs> so we were working on this during COVID. And uh, I it, it's been done for almost two years. I sat on it during that time. Because again, same hesitations I had with Los Ojos. Like it's a very different audience for me. It's a very different type of story for me. So I wasn't quite sure how to get it out into the world. Uh, we will be doing Kickstarter. So that is, that's where we're at. We, we've got a pre-launch up right now. We'll be launching this October 1st. It'll be going for 30 days throughout the month of October. But going back to your question, the creative team. So Marco Peruguini uh, is an Italian artist. I had found him on social media. And just like any relationship that I enter into with a creative partner, I asked, what is it that you want to draw? And he said, I want to draw a crime noir murder mystery story as though it were written by Stephen King after he had just read a bunch of Lovecraft stories. Nice. And I was like, I love that idea. Let's let's come up with with something together. And so we we came up with kind of this this murder mystery, this crime noir thing where there's layers of 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 crime for them to kind of sift through and, and unravel these fun layered character dynamics between these two very flawed characters, Sheila Garcia, the human character, and then Horace Nightingale, the demon character. And then this enriched world with the personification of the seven deadly sins and the four horsemen of the apocalypse now living among us and doing crime, right? Like they are mob bosses, they are running certain elements of the city. Uh, and sometimes people know that they are committing crime, but again, like our justice system can't necessarily bring them to justice. And so how do we deal with those situations? How, did they, how do they deal with these situations in the world? So Marco did this incredible job putting this book together. And originally I was envisioning it was gonna be in black and white because he has this really good crime noir style the shadows work really, really well in black and white or grayscale. But when I was talking to him about it, he often partners up with a colorist based out of the UK named Shan Benyon. And so when we approached Shan to say, would you be interested in coloring? Shan was like, yes, like I've worked with Marco a ton. And when Shan sent in the colors for this, uh, originally they were so out of what I had originally pictured. Like, I wasn't sure that I liked them. Like I liked parts of things. And then like Shan did this great job of picking up, you know, the yellow is kind of the steam color throughout the story because in the story they have brimstone rounds and brimstone is sulfur and sulfur is yellow. And I had not picked up on where Shan was putting in all of these hints of sulfur and stuff within the flashbacks with the background. And Shan had this brilliant vision that at the time I just had not necessarily aligned to. And as, as the story continued, as Shan was turning in more and more pages, I was like, no, you're brilliant. <laughs> like you are operating at a level far beyond where I am when it comes to color theory, when it comes to color application within the book. And so uh, kudos credit to the two of them because there is such a harmony there between Shan's colors and Marco's art that just creates this beautiful marriage of, of visual storytelling. And I absolutely love it. And then the icing on the cake was Micah Myers doing our letters. And I think Micah really got to play in this story in ways that he hasn't gotten to play with some of my other projects. I mean, Mike, Micah does my letters for Nexus Point on Webtoon. He's done them for a handful of other projects that I've kind of worked on. But here you've got a cast of characters. Some of them are from our world. Some of them are from the nether world. Yeah some of them are very, very different kind of personifications. And so should lust have the same type of dialogue balloons as death, as conquest, as war, as the rest. And so, you know, but but not, not trying to inundate the reader with too many different design elements within the letters. I was like, we don't want to go like 90s image, <laughs> right? Like we're not, we're not after that. We're new technologies out. And we really want to show how, how great it looks. 
we're not there. Like, you know, comics have been established. Digital lettering is a thing. Uh, we don't have to worry about those types of things. But Micah got to play. And I think that that was the key piece for this project is I got to play with a new world, with new characters, with a nuanced layer of storytelling that I've not gotten to do before. Marco got to play when it came to the designs and the visual narrative and look and feel of this book. Shan got to play when it came to the color palette and everything that was going on there. And then Micah got to play when it came to the letters and, and packaging this whole thing up. So at the end of the day, I'm so incredibly proud of the work that this team has done. I'm already working with them again on some shorter anthology work right now. Uh, we're in the Pots and Panels anthology, which will also be launching end of September slash October. And that's going to have huge names in that story. So we'll have a six pager in there where everything's kind of cooking related. And so we are naturally doing a murder mystery cooking themed story uh, called Black Cherry Pie, where somebody gets murdered by their food allergy. <laughs> darn you gluten <laughs> yeah it's i've got the gluten allergy oh. the person on this is allergic to cherry pie mm, what a shame <laughs> if i recall correctly pots and panels is uh, chuck satterley yes a guest on the show multiple times good to see that he's putting that together i've been seeing that on social media a lot actually and I can't wait to see that. It feels like it has hints of my, the old web comics what's cooking thing I did about 12 years or so ago. Yeah, he's got a, a huge collection of creators. I don't know what he's announced, so I don't want to spoil yeah. anything for people. But he's also got a pre-launch page up yeah. right now for that, too. And I think as of right now, they have over 100 people following that and, and ready for it. Whereas my follower count right now is, you know, is in the mid-60s, uh, mid to high 60s at the moment. We're hoping for 150 before we launch, but we've got you know two and a half more weeks to go before before that happens. So mm -hmm. I think I think we'll get there. Oh, yeah, for sure. And by the time this gets released, you'll already be in, in the throes of the actual campaign itself. So that'll work out well. Looking at your team itself, if you could swap roles for a day with their professional skill sets, what do you think would be the most surprising outcome? And what role would you pick? That's an excellent question. Um, I mean, Micah has the variety of projects that he works on. Shan has a diverse skill set because while we worked with Shan for colors. Shan also does art and has art accounts through social media and is doing uh, some stuff for role-playing books. So I'm, I'm really, really impressed with the, the versatility of Shan's skill set. And then Marco's artwork is just freaking gorgeous. So I think, I think it's a hard question to answer as to who I would potentially swap with. Cause I think there are benefits to, any one of them. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I have always loved drawing. I've just not been as great at it as other people. I can draw talking heads. Um, you know, my original gag strip back in the day, asshole was, was a bunch of talking heads. And then when it started to get too big for its britches, we did the stories with photos. <laughs> and so we, we were able to, to keep telling more adventurous stories that way. Uh, so for me, art, I think, is is the thing that I would most be interested in. And in terms of like how that would work out, assuming I still had my writing skill set, like being an author illustrator is has always been kind of the dream. Nice. And I know that in literary graphic novels and stuff like that, that's typically who makes it right. You've got Raina Telgemeier who can write and draw. You've got Rachel, um, Rachel Smythe, who can write and draw with Laura Olympus. Yeah. You've got all these very, very talented people out there that can dual role author illustrator. Um, and that is that is an enviable position to be in and uh, probably one that that I would I would pursue. You can see the inspirations throughout your Demon City book here. Uh, obviously, you've already hinted at it. What is the strangest or most unexpected source of inspiration you've drawn from for Demon City that you already haven't described? Well, uh, there were two, I think, big influences for me when it came to Demon City. Yes, the buddy cop tropes from movies with Die Hard and Lethal Weapon were, were big elements on there, which we've talked about a little bit. Brian Michael Bendis's powers mm. was a huge influence where, again, there's a world building element. There's a fictional element to what this is. 
Um, and I wanted to say, could I take something similar to that and make it supernatural instead of superhero? Brian knows capes and cowls. That's his bread and butter. That man has made a mark in comics in a way that uh, I only wish that I could end up making someday. And so can I can I do the same over in the supernatural realm with the kind of an urban fantasy-ish setting and story? Um, and then the other one is a, an older TV show that was inspired by a movie. I'm a big fan of Rakeen S. O'Brien. I don't know mm -hmm. if you're familiar with yeah. his work, but one of his early TV shows was Alien Nation. Mm -hmm. And it was this fish out of water, buddy cop procedural show that to me just had so much charm because there was a world building element to it. And you still had like the fish out of water character was the more down to earth, relatable, calmer person. They were the family man <laughs> and all this. And then you had the, the rogue hero that was kind of, you know, a little crazy, a little unhinged going off on their own. And so we, we did lift from some of that because Sheila Garcia is kind of the unhinged human protagonist within our story who is forced to take on Horace Nightingale under her wing Horace is not the settled family man within the story and certainly not in the way that we see, you know, in, in Lethal Weapon or in uh, Alien Nation or, or any of those other kinds of stories. But he has a different grip and philosophy on life that does make him a little bit more settled than her because uh, she's clearly going through something and he doesn't have that same trauma. And because of that, he's he's a little bit more of a, I don't want to say relatable character, but he's he's a little bit more of a healthy character. So those things, I think, are, are really where I drew a lot of inspiration from. I don't know that they're out there and, and eclectic, right? I mean, Powers is a top-selling comic book series. Alien Nation uh, made it for a full season, had a feature-length movie, and then they also made like five or six TV movies of it to cap it all off back in the day. And I don't think it's streaming anywhere right now, unfortunately, but I own it. So <laughs> I was able to kind of go back and, and rekindle what is it about this story that I loved? What is it about these characters that I related to and enjoyed? And for me, with Alien Nation and with Powers, it was this hyper fictional element of the story, whatever the MacGuffin is for that particular mystery. And these two relatable characters trying to use everyday procedural tactics to solve a mystery with something that is otherworldly. And I liked that component of it. And I tried to imbue that into Demon City as best we could. Alienation, for those that don't know about it, and it is so niche, especially when it came to 80s, 90s television. Mm -hmm. Because it was back then, and not a lot of people alive <laughs> remember that, except for us. Saltwater was one of the big things that could what that was effective against aliens. So your brimstone bullets, in in regards to your style, is like is like that perfect addition to to the world. I, I think that was a great little tidbit there. I think that was amazing. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. The the thing that was interesting about Alien Nation because it takes place in Los Angeles yeah. is that you know they're they're right by the ocean so salt water is is abundant and it's on a planet where they've crashed on the brimstone rounds in demon city are something that the demons brought from hell and started making here and so we've had to kind of adapt to this otherworldly weapon that they've created which i thought was fun but i don't even know if you've ever seen the original uh alien nation movie like mandy patinkin was in that and oh, wow you yeah, know, if I have, I can't recall it. I remember watching the original series because it was like that into like Knight Rider into like so many classic 80s television shows that were just <laughs> it felt ahead of their time, you know, back in the day. <laughs> yeah. And Rockina O'Brien has always created something that again it has the familiar element to it but then he adds something that makes it really unique and nuanced so he's got alienation he's got uh sequest dsv oh, yeah. right oh, wow. star trek underwater but it was you know a little less cowboys and a little bit more science based uh one of my favorite sci-fi shows of all time farscape yeah. um was created by by him as well and i'm oh, wow. sure he's done more under his belt but those are the top three that are at the top of my brain right now. And again, 
taking the familiar and adding in the unknown. And I liked that element of it. And I tried to kind of recreate some of that with Demon City. Well, you've succeeded. I think it's a, it's a solid hit overall. And those that get to read it will definitely enjoy it. I really want to see their reactions to the, the story itself. So when, once it gets into the hands of the masses, I definitely want to see like some tweets or something, because I think they're really going to enjoy this series and say, where's issue two or where's the next hardcover? Yeah, well, issue issue two will be in there. It'll be six issues, the whole story in the deluxe graphic novel. Um, but again, like it, like any good lethal weapon movie or buddy cop story or anything, like the opportunity for sequels exist, but we solve the mystery in this tale. Um, but we have more ground that we can explore with the world, with the supporting characters, with uh, in to a degree some of the main characters' backstories, so that we can always we can always continue to pull at those threads. Yeah, definitely for sure. Yeah. Uh, Comics itself, and, and we we all consume media in, in different ways here, but specifically with comics, if you could add a new sense beyond the typical five that we have um, to enhance how readers experience your comic, what would it be and why? It's an excellent question. Um, I think you already have a lot of readers out there that you know, are using one of their senses when it comes to comics, which is the visual component. You have some readers out there who use a different sense. If, you know, like some Daredevil comics have been written in Braille and they've had some of the artwork punched up on the pages so that blind readers can enjoy those stories as well. And I've always um, really credited them for trying to, to get those to, to try to make the, the genre and the stories more widely accessible to people. Um, but for me, it would probably have to be the, the mental connection with the characters and the ability to kind of experience what they do. I, I don't know that you would necessarily call this like a sixth sense, right? But ability to kind of project yourself into the story and experience what the characters experience themselves as a writer we kind of get to do this because i have a very method kind of way of writing my characters where i am that character when i am writing them so i know what they're thinking i know what they're feeling i know what their motivations are and you hope that that comes out onto the page when it gets translated out into the artwork into the dialogue into all the various elements that kind of appear there for the reader to consume the ability for people to have some of that extra knowledge to get some of those additional teases of things, I think would be a fun and interesting kind of experience above and beyond just the five senses, right? Like, yeah, if you want to do a scratch and sniff comic, you can, if you want to do an audio comic, you can, you can tap into those other five senses right now. But the only other one that I think would be unexplored and, you know, we don't have a way to necessarily do this yet, but it ties in a little bit to my next point comic where everyone's kind of connected through a digital medium is can we actually connect and share what we feel, what we think, what we're experiencing in real time. The the five senses of the characters in the story, if you will. Sounds like this uh, sounds like Demon City needs to be a VR game or something like that something the vr games i think tend to have like a silent protagonist sometimes mm. you know i always think about um portal or yeah. uh, half-life and the ability to do that i mean alex wasn't was not uh silent in the latest half-life okay. vr game yeah. that they made but the ability to, like one of the reasons why people connect to those types of characters like a link character or, or those is because they are silent and they are able to kind of project themselves into that character more yeah. with a linkage into like the actual story it's almost like you get to be a bit of an actor and you get to kind of do a one person play and you are all of the characters within the story and i think that that's kind of fun and interesting and and then you get to see and experience a little bit more of the nuances of the world and the characters yeah, for sure. It's uh, who knows what how technology is going to make our mediums better in the future. You know how we can experience them. I'm glad there are some, as you've mentioned, that are going forward with the various types, and I think that's great to see that everyone has accessibility to this medium. So I think that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. The one thing I find interesting is you've done so many different 
things with different comics in terms of not only promotion, but you've done webtoons with, uh, of course, Nexus Point and uh, Repossessed. You've done self-publishing. You've done crowdfunding. We're back to crowdfunding now because you've, you've basically done a, site, a circuit here. Back to mm-hmm. crowdfunding for Demon City. Why are we doing crowdfunding this time around? Wonderful questions. Like some of my previous self-published and crowdfunded comic projects, we tried to shop this project around to various publishers. And it's not uncommon for publishers to pass on a new project or a new series, especially if it's not necessarily uh, a perfect fit within their portfolio, or if there's something that they don't necessarily connect with. Again, this was this was a hard R story. So I knew that it wanted we wanted to go for kind of that mature reader's Uh, storytelling in terms of violence, in terms of language, in terms of other thematical elements within the story. Yes, there's sex and nudity. Um, So again, a new playground for me to kind of play with. And and publishers just kind of said no. But I loved the story so much that I had to say yes. I needed this story to come out into the world. And the easiest way to do that was through Kickstarter. Now we got close with a publisher because I had pitched this story to Webtoon. I had included it with a package of pitches. Like Webtoon had originally uh, asked me to, to send them pitches and I, I included it in there knowing that it was not going to be a good fit for the platform, but trying to buy myself some time to come up with something that was better. And a story that I that I like to tell at conventions, I've maybe told this story three or four times, so I'm going to tell it to you and first time it's ever been in a podcast. Um, but I, I thought Demon City was a horrible fit for Webtoon. And so naturally they loved it. And so I'll, I'll tell you the pitch that, that I kind of gave to them. And it's, it's a quick summary of what the story is. So Demon City is a, a story about the end of the world has happened. Demons from hell now live among us. And the first demon detective has just caught his first case, which is the last homicide that will ever happen because somebody has just murdered death and now no one else can die. And again, Webtoon is very PG-13, very teen drama. Think like things that would be on the CW or like teen-related kind of anime stories. This was a hard R, gritty kind of story. And so Webtoon comes back and they're like, we love it, but we have some notes. And I was like, okay, what are your notes? And they're like, first of all, nobody can hate the demons. And I was like, what? And they're like, yeah, the, the two cops, they've got to be BFFs from the word go. And I was like, it's a buddy cop story. They need to bicker like an old married couple. That's part of the charm. Like, and and nobody hates the demons. They're demons from hell, man. Like people would hate them. They're like, there can be a group of people that don't like the demons and they're clearly wrong and the bad guys, but the average person needs to be okay with demons living among them. I was like, all right, that's a very different take than what I was envisioning. What else did you have from a note? So like two, do they have to be cops? Nobody really likes cops right now. And we were wondering if instead you could change their professions. You know, maybe maybe they're retired cops or maybe they're like, you know, private on investigators and they're trying to help out one of their buddies with, with a problem. And I was like, private investigators don't investigate homicide. They're like, that's the other thing. Does death have to die? Couldn't death just go on a vacation and not have told anybody? And I'm thinking about the major story beats within that pitch. And I was like, what part of this story did you like again? (laughs) We love everything about it. We just want you to change all of it. (laughs) So this one I walked away from. This one I was like, you know, thanks, but no thanks. I'm not interested in in watering this story down that's not the type of story that i'm interested in telling we just went our own way and honestly between you and me and all of your readers i was already like 20 pages into producing this thing (laughs) the way that we were gonna make it anyway so uh so we did pass on that one but so long answer to a short question like you know it's a story like crowdfunding allows me to tell a story the way i want to tell it without any of the politics or bureaucracy or internal notes from some of those teams that just don't align to the vision that I have, the story I want to tell or the project or the trajectory that I want my characters to take (laughs) throughout the tale. And so it does provide a lot of freedom for creators like myself 
to be able to tell those stories that aren't necessarily as commercially viable as a Miles Morales or a, you know, Powers or a Radiant Black or any of those types of stories that are out there, but still has an audience, still has a following and still has a purpose to be out there in the world. And so the reason that we decided to go back to Kickstarter was, you know, I, I did Zoop uh, with Los Ojos and I had a very positive experience with the Zoop people. Um, I, I would recommend it to anyone that was starting out to do crowdfunding for the first time. I did it as kind of a stepping stone to remind myself what crowdfunding was like. Mm -hmm. And now I want to see if I can go back to Kickstarter and, and do it all again myself. And maybe we can. That would be wonderful and fantastic. And I hope that we find a huge audience for this. Um, and, you know, if if we can't, then I'll, maybe I'll take my next one back to Zoop again, because, again, they, those guys were fantastic to work with. Uh, and I absolutely enjoyed that experience immensely. Uh, they took a lot of the work off of my shoulders when it came to promotion, when it came to finding places to do reviews and interviews and podcasts and all those things. And they had a built-in audience there that was ready to go and, and fired up for this type of title. Uh, I don't know that we'll find that again on, on Kickstarter. Um, I'm hoping that some of my young readers that enjoyed Albert the Alien are ready for something that's a little bit, and, and by a little bit, I mean radically different. Uh, and I'm hoping too that the discoverability of the platform too will allow us to kind of get exposure to new audiences and new readers who really like things like Hellboy and Lethal Weapon and Lovecraft, because honestly, there's a lot of visual aesthetics and story beats that align to those types of uh, stories, those types of elements. So mm -hmm. really long answer to a short question. That's why we ended up going with Kickstarter. And, uh, and here's hoping that Webtoon continues to hire me for other projects that are appropriate for their platform to go with. <laughs> you know, minus the notes. Um... <laughs> It's great that they had a different vision. It's great that they're what they produced is well done. I, I enjoy what they have on the platform, so I think it's it's rather entertaining. I'm glad to see that you've had success with the other works there too. I'm I'm sure you'll be back eventually with another series, whatever the case may be. But I think yeah, this is a good point in in your journey to get back to what you know and love. And I'm glad that uh, you're doing this, and it'll be a successful campaign. I, I'm sure of it. I'll call it here now. So there you go. <laughs> I appreciate that. By the, by the time this video comes out, fully funded. <laughs> <laughs> Within 24 hours. There you go. If you could collaborate with any historical figure, an artist or writer, or whoever the case may be, on a comic project, who would it be and why? It's a fantastic question. I mean, as a writer, I always want to work with other artists because, again, the, the compliment and the, the collaboration between the two is, is such an, an enjoyable experience for me. Whenever I end up getting pages back from an artist and seeing their interpretation of what I had put into the script, it's it's like opening up a present on your birthday every single time you get an email from them. It's, it's such a wonderful, wonderful experience. And I've enjoyed every collaborator that I have worked with to date. Um, I've, I've been very, very blessed to have really, really great creators to work with on there. Simultaneously doing a joint written project with somebody who is a much better writer than me uh, would be a fantastic learning experience, like an Alan Moore or something mm -hmm. like that, right? Like, I mean, I don't know that Alan would ever co-write something with, with somebody else, but even just being a fly on the wall while he worked on stuff would be, I, I feel like I would just seep in so much knowledge and experience just from that would be wonderful. Um, but in terms of artists and stuff, I mean, you know, anyone from some of the early image days, and it doesn't have to be the original founders like a Jim Lee. I mean, sure, a dream job, right? I would love to work with Jim Lee. Uh, Jim Lee don't need to work with me. <laughs> um, but uh, but like a talent Caldwell or a Michael Turner, um, even Laura Braga, who's a, a fantastic artist. She did Witchblade for the longest time. And now she does a lot of stuff with with Archie titles. Uh, and I've met Laura many times over at New York Comic Con, and she's just such a sweet and enjoyable person to be around. And I just, I know that she would bring so much to a project. Talent Caldwell's art style has always dropped my jaw whenever I've seen it. When he's doing Wildcats Nemesis, when he was doing some of the, the Witchblade stuff, when he was doing Wildcats, um, 
or Fathom, when mm-hmm. his work on Fathom and Killian's Tide, uh, just always, always, always captivated me. I somewhere behind me here, I've got his um, his Superman graphic novel that he drew that Michael Turner wrote, oh, wow. um, Superman Godfall. Amazing, incredible talent, and again, just the the caliber that they would bring to upping the ante when it came to visual storytelling within any of my my stories would be a godsend. Um, and so, you know, love to work with like a Kirby because <laughs> that that man defined what modern day comics and visual storytelling look like, especially when it comes from a cosmic or a supernatural sense with um silver surfer with uh you know the the fantastic four with all of those characters that he created back in the day and just that visual language that he put in there was was so amazing even if it's not necessarily a project to work on together with them just being able to pick their brains would be a blessing um so I, I I love those people, and then you know talent and and Laura and and those folks are all alive, and I would love to to work with them uh, at some point. I mean, talent did a, a cover for us or a pinup for us for Albert the Alien because he loved the Albert the Alien character uh-huh. when I when I originally met him. Uh, I've not engaged Laura to do any kind of artwork for me yet, but would love to uh, at some point. Um, so I think those two might just be a matter of time, um, but for the rest of them, it's you know. It's a, it's a wishful thinking. How has working on Demon City changed your perspective on the buddy cop genre? I don't know that it's necessarily changed my perspective on it. I've always enjoyed it. The structure, the formula, the components of it. I think what I've always tried to do with my stories is how do I add my own voice to this? How do I make this something that's at least a little bit unique in the space? And for me, that's a fun challenge. And that's something that I've always enjoyed doing. I, Los Ojos was, was a huge challenge when it came to just trying to write a mature reader's story from, from the get-go. This one was how do I kind of imbue myself within a buddy cop kind of crime noir story. And that supernatural layer in there, I think, adds a uniqueness to it that I've not seen in anything else. So I don't know that it's necessarily changed uh my perspective when it comes to buddy cops what it has done is opened my eyes to what are the possibilities to add into or to you know um or to augment what is possible within a buddy cop type story and that's something that i really enjoy and something that i'll likely continue to explore with future projects because heaven forbid we you know Buddy cops in hell, buddy cops in space, buddy cops in whatever. Is it a comedy? Is it a hard drama? Is it a fantasy story? Like there's so much there that you can kind of do and augment and 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 have fun with. And uh, and it's just finding the right artists to bring it to life and the right team to make it look good uh, is is next. But you know, as of right now, again, my, my goal is get Demon City out into the world. And if there's demand, we'll make another one. And if it's not demand, I'm going to keep working with Marco, Shan, and Micah on other projects. Again, we're already working together on pots and panels, and I'm sure we will find other projects to work on together as well. Awesome. You know, Trev, we could always dive into more stuff. We could always talk longer. We could always try to push that four-hour limit we did way back when, uh, which will never happen to get him. I'm ready and willing. Let's do it. (laughs) I would need five more pots of coffee just for that to happen. Can't do it today, obviously. But I always love having you on the show because unfortunately that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for being back on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It is always a joy to speak with you, my friend. And uh, and I can't wait until you start coming to cons again so that we can start hanging out in person. Yeah, because it's been a while. I think we're overdue, and I would love to do that again. Yeah, no, I, 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 I miss the con scene. I definitely want to get back to it. Like wherever you are, I, just tell me the con that's close by, and I will be. I'll drive, fly, do whatever to get out that way, just so we can you can reconnect. Because I don't think we ever did dinner or lunch or anything like that. We only just saw every, every each other in passing. 
It, that could be. But honestly, too, I might start expanding out into Canada mm -hmm. as well with okay. some cons. So I'm I'm in talks right now with a few places to see if they can help cover off some expenses. Because again, I'm doing this full time now. Like this is this is what pays the bills. And a lot of the work, the easiest way to sell it is directly face to face when it comes to meeting fans and people at conventions. So trying to see if I can add more of those into my repertoire and Canada's an untapped market right now. We'd be happy to have you, that's for sure. So if you make it to Fan Expo Canada in Toronto, I'll definitely apply for the media passes that time around just to just to catch you face to face. I will keep you posted. <laughs> Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where is all of your amazing works that we can purchase? Where's the Kickstarter? Yeah. Uh, so if you go to my social media page, I've got tons of links going to the Kickstarter for Demon City Volume 1, Hell on Earth. Uh, please check it out and uh, pledge to help bring this comic out into the world. I would really appreciate it. In terms of where I am, you can find me at Trevor A. Mueller is my handle on every platform, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Blue Sky, Threads, find me, follow me, friend me. I also have a newsletter that you can sign up for at trevoramuller.com slash newsletter. It comes out monthly, uh, unless I've got a Kickstarter going, then it might come out a little bit more often than that. But um, it's it's a easiest way for me to keep in touch with people is just via through email or social media. So Trevor A. Mueller is my everything. Find me, follow me, friend me. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talk. You could, of course, find this interview and Trevor's 11 other plus interviews from the past on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's T-W-O. Uh, but the website's going through a revamp. Go to our YouTube channel. That's always updated, youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. The podcast is back. Search Two Geeks Talking wherever you get your podcasts on whatever platform you enjoy and as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.